Season 4 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, Polar Inertia, a journal of nomadic and popular culture, online at polarinertia.com, and Medivate, a community and set of tools to help you build the kind of meditation practice you'd like to have, online at medivate.com. Any recommendations for how I should perceive my first shopping mall in Britain? Well, I think you're in a good place for me. I think this is um, this is what shopping malls used to look like. I mean, it's, when you're getting both contrasts here, is we're in uh, Stratford. Um, no, I don't know. I think it's called Shopping City. I think Shopping City. I think so. Um, but this is um, kind of almost. I think this is quite a typical ni- 1970s kind of what we would have called a shopping centre. And uh, over the road, just behind us, is the largest covered shopping mall in Europe, or the largest shopping mall in Europe. And it's quite unusual in uh, the UK in the sense that it's got open areas as well. It's kind of like, basically, it's a small, it's the size of a kind of a provincial town just dropped into the Stratford Marshes. It's quite, quite alien. Uh, I, I hate it with an intense passion. And you don't hate the old school one? No, oh, I love the old school one. There was one like this in the town where I grew up, High Wycombe, which is not far away. And I came to London in 1989, and I lived just up the road from here as an 18-year-old student, just moved into a terrace house, East London, just left home and so I found this place really comforting because this was like the one we had in our um, our town centre in High Wycombe and you know now actually it's had a little bit of a makeover you could see I think it had this makeover I don't know probably about 10 years ago I think maybe slightly less so it's, they've opened the roof here it's quite bright then it was when I first came here it was really dark and dingy and smoky because people would be smoking in here which as is, was the fashion as was the fashion it was exactly like the one from my hometown a bit sort of subterranean and a bit murky and you can see down behind us so we just walked through where there's a fruit and vegetable market and there's traders selling those kind of big pairs of underpants for like <laughs> a, three for a pound you know um that kind of thing is almost like a traditional street market and then at night time when we used to come off the night bus from drinking in central London, we'd walk back through here and we'd play football, you know, or soccer with the, uh, with the old rotten fruit, you know, and you could run through here and have fantastic games, you know. But Westfield over the road couldn't be more different. I mean, it's a total clash of cultures. Steps away is such a contrast to the kind of thing you find in London, it turns out. Yes, exactly, exactly. And, um, you know, the chart, the, the, that's the, the slight worry, not to go straight into negativity, but a lot of the new developments you see in London, are, are, are my thing is they're trying to smooth it out more for rich people. But uh, at the moment, it's still a city of great contrast. This is Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, speaking here in London in Stratford with John Rogers, author of the book This Other London, Adventures in the Overlooked City. You might also have heard him on the Resonance FM show, Adventures and Adventures in Topography. And from the blog, is it Lost Byway or Lost Byways? I can never remember. Lost Byway. Lost Byway, singular. Of course, his book is all about not taking the tube, not biking, not driving, but walking, and walking is what we're doing today. What direction should we walk in from here? I think we should walk back in time, really, Colin. We'll walk back into old Stratford. I'll take you down to Stratford Church, and then uh, we'll go to the remains of uh, Stratford Abbey. Hmm. And then from there, we'll see where we end up. We could go along the, uh, the, the Bowback Rivers from there, maybe. Onward, then. Now, let me ask you this as we walk. I mentioned to you off mic before, this is my first time in London, indeed in England. To know the other London, do you have to know the standard London? It's a good, it's a good question. I mean, I think, I suppose the standard London by this, I suppose you mean the kind of the heritage sites that most people would recognise from an outline, really. Big Ben, so, yes. I suppose, and now the London Eye. I think, it's, uh, I think they're unavoidable. Um, yeah, I, maybe you do, maybe you do. I think, in a way, though, London is, a, you know, it's, it's a city which has grown a lot in the last sort of, 150 years. So really, when you come out to places like this, in a way, this is the real London, I, uh, I feel. I don't, because my first experience of London really was, was this part of, was this part of the world, was East London, really. And I, I come from west of London. So although I'd had done a day trip to St Paul's Cathedral, um, I don't know how much of a sense you get of the 
the sort of day-to-day lives of people. I think you need to come out to like a shopping centre like this and you see people buying cheap clothes and fresh fish, and mm. which you don't necessarily get in um, Westminster. What aspect of the real London, shall we say, then, is that you get to see... You can figure out what Londoners do when you're in the real London. There's The evidence is around you. Maybe. I suppose, actually, when I sort of say it like that, I suppose the real London, I suppose maybe... I, I don't know what I mean. I mean... I, <laughs> It can be variously defined. Yeah, that's a contentious thing, isn't it, I suppose. I, you know what I found, actually, by being a, a tourist is, uh, you, you know, it's usually worth, in the really sort of famous tourist locations, the, the heritage sites don't usually let you down. I mean, they're, they're well, you know, so it's not as if you go there to Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris and go, well, this is crap. <laughs> what did I come here for? I think it's the same. And, and obviously, you know, lots of parts of central London are incredibly vibrant and... Um, fascinating places to experience. For me, I don't think it would be an either-or. The reason I focused on the areas I did is just they just don't get written about in the same way. In your book, you write about places that, by definition, haven't had much writing done about them. Not, not a great deal, or certainly not in the last 50 years or so. I mean, one of the things that inspired me to write the book was discovering this great tradition of what were described as topographical books or ramble books that particularly were, were very, seemed to be very popular in the interwar years, sort of in the 1920s and 30s. And uh, they had such a passion for places that now we sort of sneer at and look down our noses at. And so I wanted to almost sort of revive that tradition. And that was, if, if people have heard the Ventures and Adventures in Topography podcast, that really was the start point for that series of podcasts, was literally taking those walks from those books and redoing them. And then I thought, well, actually, I quite like the idea of adding to that tradition and and bringing it up to date a little bit Um, but you know what we have in the say the 50, 60, 70, 80 years since those books were written is we have now a legacy of those places being maligned really and put down and people turn their notes so it's actually sort of to a degree it was kind of about reversing some of those negative uh, impressions that have built up. You know. When did the public turn on these places? Or what kind of places are they that people decided were no longer worthy of consideration? Well, you could, I mean, what you could say, if you were being cynical, you could say it's when people started living in them, really. <laughs> because, you know, in, in, uh, in some ways they were, they were built up. A lot of them were really built up in the early part of the 20th century, the end of the 19th century. I mean, Stratford really started to grow from the 1860s. A lot of these areas around London really do. I mean, the popula- when you look at the population, like Leighton, where I just walked through today, had a population of about 5,000 in 1860. Mm-hmm. By, by 1900, it was, it was 100,000. Mm-hmm. So they had a massive population growth. So a lot of the houses and the new areas were being built in the 20s, you know, 1910s, 1920s. So the, the topographical writers were going out and discovering new suburbs and new places or places that had grown out of existing villages if you like so they were discovering them in a way as new places it seems like London has has maintained a current of topographical interest or psychogeographical interest as well some say you know you've been called for example the drinking man Ian Sinclair and who will be a guest on this show soon I mean he's just one of several throughout history I'll put it this way. It seems like London breeds interest in place more than other cities. Do you think that's true? I mean, I'm passionate about London because I've lived here on and off for 25 years. I mean, I say on and off. I've, the six years that I haven't been here, I've been out of the country. So in my adult life, I've not really lived anywhere else. Um, I don't know about making those comparisons. I think the, with, certainly with my practice, if you could call it that, you could apply that to wherever you live, and I think you would find similar things. You know, they would be different in terms of their substance, but the practice you could apply to wherever you live. I like to think people should feel proud and passionate about wherever you live. But, um, I don't like to do that comparative thing. I mean, London for me is endlessly fascinating. It, there are endless layers of of meaning and narrative and, and, and history and folklore and tradition. And I don't know, it's like I liken it to painting the Sydney Harbour Bridge. You know, the guys who paint the Sydney Harbour Bridge, they when they get to one end that they have to start and go back you know um that's what walking around london exploring it is a bit like it's not just walking through it it's walking through the same places yeah. having a relationship where you return to these places over and over again this is it and it's you know it's interesting just already talking as we have done about 
the real London and, and, and uh, what defines sort of certain areas is actually it's incredibly difficult to pin London down. Um, whereas, I don't think it's... We were talking earlier on, actually, before you know, we started recording about uh, LA, where, I, where obviously you're based, yes. and I've, I've been a few times, and it feels that people rush to make quick definitions of LA that aren't necessarily contested. I'm not saying... Right, the myths do stick, the and myths, they'll for a long time. Yeah, exactly, exactly, whereas I think London's a little bit more resistant to that. Although I'm, I'm obviously not convinced those myths about Los Angeles are necessarily necessarily true but I mean maybe they're easier to pin down in some context sure they are it depends on which which Los Angeles you're looking at yeah. as in I think in London there are so many more Londons even than there are Los Angeleses so there's it's just what do you stick to when you're trying to tell a false story about London you know well this is it you know what's interesting where we are at the moment is I mean really um, I hadn't realized this until recently is that you know when you look at uh, the greater London was created in the mid well in the mid 60s really it came into being in 1965 formally but i think it was first the constitution of what is now greater london was first proposed i think in 1963 so sort of you look at 50 years really of, of greater london as a singular entity so actually this would have been essex uh, technically it's been essex you know the river lee i mean really the county of london as it was then ended at the at the end of the river lee so this and and where i live in leytonstone which is only um you know, two miles, three miles up the road, just just ahead of us. It, you know, there were people that I know who are, who are old, you know, a bit older, and, and they think of themselves as having been born in Essex and have grown up in the county of Essex. Whereas nobody today living in Leytonstone would think of themselves as living in Essex. The identity is now different. Yeah, and actually, the, you know, the, and London's constructed of boroughs, you know, 32 boroughs, and um, the, the borough of Waltham Forest, where I live, this is the borough of Newham. Um, the borough of Waltham Forest is an area of Waltham Forest where the people con continuously campaign to be returned to Essex. I see. They still don't consider themselves as being part of London. The identity battles go on. Yeah, whereas actually there are other parts that are further out geographically from the centre of London. Traditionally, I think the measurements are made from Charing Cross in the centre of London. But yet they have a very strong identity of being part of London. So, yeah, it's a, flu it's a fairly fluid thing, and it's actually something that the more I've researched London, the, the, the question of what is London I find even harder to pin down than I did when I first started really seriously researching it. I, I'm, I'm more confused now than I ever have been, I think. The only way is to get down in, on foot, then, to your mind. Yeah, exactly. I think to get down and to, and to experience it and to sense it. Obviously, the, you know, reading and, and book work is, is interesting, it's fascinating, it's important, but... It's when you get down and you, and you walk and you look around you that you see certainly the shape of the land, I think, is something which you become aware of in the way you don't if you're just hurtling through it underground right. in a pod, you know, in a tube. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere, really. And, um, it's interesting where we... I mean, it's worth mentioning where we've where we, where we stood now in terms of the various narratives that exist within London, you know. Uh, powerful resonance is, is that we stood in front of Stratford Church and it's a paved concrete area you know there's pigeons and people are having their lunch out here but this is where you know the Stratford martyrs were burnt at the stake you know only about what 500 600 years ago and it's something that you can't read about Stratford any kind of history about Stratford without it coming up right it's going to come up which, yeah which strikes me as kind of odd because you know there were a lot of people being burnt at the stake at the time you yes, know not just here but all over yeah and yeah actually this is one that you know it happened one it really obviously embedded itself really deeply in the psyche of the people it really which I, i'm a bit affronted by because a guy called john rogers was actually uh, carted through stratford and burnt at the stake at smithfield no one no one locally seemed to care <laughs> no, one, no one was bothered this is the kind of thing you turn up yeah. when you when as you, long when you don't do it here we don't care what yeah. you do yeah. <laughs> You mentioned your practice. What is your practice? How do you describe what your practice is? Oh, it's good, yeah, actually. I'm, I'm glad you caught me out on that one. I'm trying to pin... Well, I suppose, really, in its, in its bare essence, when I, when I talk about it as a practice, I suppose because I've just written the book, This Other London, but previous to that, um, I made the radio shows, Ventures and Adventures in Topography with Nick Papadimitrio, and previous to that... I worked on a public art project with my sister um, that was funded by the Arts Council here, and that was called Remapping High Wycombe. And there's a consistency of approach, so I suppose that's why I refer to it as a practice, which m maybe authors don't necessarily do. And really, it's, it is this thing of digging into your locality of where you are, 
my interest in London really comes out of my interest in localism. I mean, initially, really, I didn't really know much about London. I used to research where I lived in Islington, where I worked on the South Bank. I started researching where I live in Leytonstone. Specific places you were in, not yeah. just London. That's right, and it grew out of that. And really, it's a practice of you know using old uh, topographical sources, ramble books, uh, and then comparing this with old maps, looking at little bits, scraps of kind of uh, popular culture that relates to the area. Um, I mean, soccer is a great, as you would call it, is a great reference, is a great source for that. You know, when you look into the culture around local football clubs and local sporting institutions, local community groups, local politics, and then kind of making a kind of messy palimpsest of that uh, through walking it and experiencing it and then creating something from that experience. So you're sort of mixing it all up and creating something new. So I'm not a diligent historian, right. and, and neither am I a kind of prose poet who's just spinning off his head. It's kind of a... It is a bit of a... The Drinking Man's Ian Sinclair, I think, is... Uh, a, a, I'm happy to go with that. Yeah. You know, happy to go. There are worse titles to have, certainly. Because I do do a lot of my work in the pub as well. That's it. <laughs> Now, tell me about the actual walking. When did you begin taking what people would consider to be extended, very long walks? Well, it's interesting. I mean, <laughs> uh, for as long as I can remember, I mean, you know, um, and I know that might sound like an answer a lot of people give a gift because, you know, we all walk. But yeah. I grew up in the, um, I grew up about 25 miles from London in, in the South Chilterns. And, um, just outside a place called High Wycombe and it's you know my dad is kind of like a character from bygone times in a way he's like one he is really one of the last old kind of hill people you know like children. you know he grew up going out poaching from a very young age with a ferret and a folding shotgun you know from when he's a teenager and you know he's great he's great at woodcraft and things like that so really my childhood was spent walking with my dad from, well, my earliest memories are of, are of that. So, really, it was always very much something that I did, and uh, it was the way I got around, you know. Mm. So I never really ever stopped walking from then. So when my friends started getting cars, you know, things like that, and we started going to pubs and going to watch bands, I would just walk. Mm. You know, if that was four or five miles, that's fine, it wouldn't bother me. When I first came up here to London, I live not far away from where we are now, just up the road in Forest Gate. I used to go to uh, what was then City of London Polytechnic, now it's London Met University, and that's about, it's way near where you're staying actually, in Brick Lane, in the East End. Right. I used to just walk there and back. Every well, day? Not every day, no, often you get the bus a lot of the time, but <laughs> I'd frequently walk back, because that was the way, it's the way I understood about getting around, really. And I think as well, I applied a lot of the things you know, when I walked with my dad, he knew everything about, he knew what all the birds were, he knew all the trees, he knew all the plants. Um, that having that awareness of your environment, I suppose I just naturally transferred that to an urban environment. Right, right. And that's the only way you can have, that's the only means of transportation in which you can have that type of awareness, isn't it? It's hard to when you're enclosed in a car or indeed the tube or... Cycling is decent for it, but you're going a little bit faster. W walking gives you what in terms of an aid to awareness? Yeah, totally. I, I think, I think you know, a, a bus is a really good way to experience a city, I think, in a funny way. Like, I always used to want to get a bus in L.A., actually. Right. Because, That's, you know... It's the busiest bus system in America, so... Is you, it? Yeah. To so think, well, you know, it seems to be something that people that I knew that just didn't do. So right. I thought, well, who hang on, there's a lot of people getting the buses. I want to go and see what what they're doing, who are they, and what are they doing, what they're talking about on the bus, yes. you know. So I think you, you can, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't think you can fully experience the, the environment in the same way. You don't have the same connection, you know, you're not in it, you're on it, you know, and I think when you're walking, you are, you are in London. You're in the environment of, of the bus in a way. You, that's the texture you're feeling out yeah, is exactly. the interior of the bus and the sort of societies that form there. And you're dealing with it as well, aren't you? You're dealing with the person sitting next to you. You're dealing with the temperature in the bus. You're dealing, you know, you're dealing with the fact it's running late or here they this thing where they terminate early, you know. Right. They stop, we go, oh, we've got to regulate the service. Everyone's got to get out, you know. 
So that that's it. it becomes your experience, I think. You do have these, and they're passing by in great numbers, these double-decker buses, so you get a good vantage point here if you sit up top. You, you do. I mean, God, there's definitely something to be said for it. I mean, running the top deck of a bus is great. Also, the overground in London is a great way. I, it's a great way of spotting places that you want to go back and have another look at, because the overground also is built along a series of viaducts and embankments, so you get a really good view across the rooftops. So... You know, I'd never be one to say um, the only way to experience yes. a place is to is to walk. But I just think it gives you the best experience of a place, particularly when you when you live there. You know, but also it brings it, it introduces an element of randomness which you don't get when you're on public transport because, right. by definition, they they operate along a route, a predefined route. Whereas when you're walking, you know. Anything can happen. I'm glad you bring that up after having brought up the London Overground, because I was talking to somebody recently who's lived here a while, and he was <coughs> saying how he realizes the Overground goes certain places, but because it's not the tube, it's not in his mental map of where you can go in London. So no. essentially, it's, it doesn't appear to him as a possibility the places the Overground goes. And I mean, this extends all the way to... You know, your mind locks into the map, whether it's freeways, whether it's the tube, whether it's where the buses go, whether it's where the bike paths are. Uh, you get out of those, you get out of those grooves if you walk, or you're able to get out of those grooves, aren't you? Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, they're not. It's not a timetable journey. You know, it, it's a journey which it has those random elements in it. It, it, it also kind of. Um, it just exposes you to a different type of thought pattern as well. I mean, for me, at times, it's almost a meditative state that you could enter into, which, uh, I don't know, I've never had that experience on a bus. I think there's, I think there's something it's about... It's much more difficult to achieve on a bus. Yeah, I think it's something, you know, just basically physiological about the rhythm that you adopt when you walk and the things that you see and the way you engage with the world around you. Um, you just can't when you're on public transport. I mean, for... For about four or five years, I used to I used to uh, work on the South Bank, which is on the Thames, sort of like the cultural quarter, if you like, where you got uh, the National Theatre and Tate Modern. Should we go through this park, actually? Yeah? Talking of randomness. Yes, let's, slightly, let's do it. Slightly off the route I initially planned, so it's a good example, but I'm just thinking it might give us a bit of relief from the, uh, the traffic. It's also, um, also because I've not been in here for about 15 years, I don't <laughs> think. So now, now since not since the uh, later 90s, have you set foot in this park? I don't think so, because it's not part of West Ham Park. This is a little adjunct of it, because there's a really beautiful park on the other side, which if you go into a park in this area, you go there, because this is kind of like poor cousin, but it's still quite nice. I see. Um, but I used to, basically, I used to commute to work on foot. So mm. it was a journey that, if you ask people, you know, how would you get from the Angel to the South Bank? They'd say, you know, you get this bus or you get this tube. Right. But, um... Because I was working in like in a in a sort of like a I was working in a cinema there, so I was sort of in the dark all day in the day in a little office or sitting, you know, at a counter. So I used to I used to I used to walk, you know, every day to and from work. So it really it was a commute. I knew how long it took, but it stimulated me in a way that it, it just didn't. If I had to get the bus or the tube, then it was just a slog, you know. You just sort of like you know, just, oh my god, just get me there, just you know. <laughs> Please, no one talk to me. Don't you know? Just don't. I don't want to interrupt. Whereas when you walk, you know, you felt you had a degree of liberty. That's oh. the way I used to feel. It was a part of my day, or well, two sections of my day when I was walking to and from work, where I felt like I was free mm. within the city. Whereas normally you feel you're under certain constraints, maybe right. and certain pressures. And when I was walking to, you know, I just didn't feel any of that. You know, mm. Mm. it's. It is. It is the way that it, it's the way of getting around that gives you the sense that theoretically you could go anywhere. Maybe it'll take you a while. Yeah. Maybe you'll uh, fall into some mud along the way. But you could do whatever you want at any moment. Nothing's locking you into anything. That's right. That's, mm. that's it completely. I mean, a squirrel might fall on your head any minute, and we'll walk into this street. <laughs> you mentioned rambling books. That's something that people might not know about if they're not from London or not haven't delved into books about London. What is a, what is a rambling book? I mean, to be fair, not many people in London would have... Yes. I mean, um, a ramble book, is, in its basic form, was a, just a walking guide, you know? So it would just say, you know, start here, turn left, cross the road. Mm. So sometimes, you know, I'd pick them up maybe because you think, oh, okay, well, that's... 
an interesting route that takes me through a part of London I've not been before. So if I was going to go there, maybe that would give me a start. But then what I discovered, these books would have, you know, an introductory chapter. Mm-hmm. And there was a real... It, it extended far beyond what it needed to do. <laughs> yes. There was a real um, sensibility for me, which, in the end, I started to see, maybe fancifully, but, uh, fancifully, but I started to see it. It's almost forming like a kind of proto-psychogeography in a way. There, I thought... These were almost manifestos, these introductions? Yes, I mean, I did actually cobble together a couple of manifestos. I, t- I took three or four of these authors and I extrapolated bits and I presented it as a manifesto in the way you might right. find the Situationist manifesto. Right. Now, who were these people writing the Ramble books? Who, who, what type of, type of fellows were they? Well, for a start, they mostly were fellows. Yes. You're correct about that. They're, although one of the best topographical books uh, I've read... It's called The Skirts of the Great City by Mrs. Arthur G. Bell. Mm. Um, but they were usually were, yeah, they were usually men. They were usually obviously middle-aged men. A lot of them seem to have been journalists. Mm. Um, so these books would have been part-time projects that earned them an extra bit of cash. Certainly in the case of there's one author called S.P.B. Mays, who's one of my f- favourites. He's one of the few, actually, that I found out a bit about because he's had a biography written about him, and it's mainly because he, he used to um, present a popular BBC programme oh. in the 30s, I mean, you know. But, um, yeah, so they were kind of quite idiosyncratic characters. They might be seen as being slightly curmudgeonly, maybe, uh-huh. and slightly sort of old-fashioned and maybe small-c conservative in a way. Or that seems like a character they would almost be willing to play in that setting. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. here's here's who I'm going to be writing this ramble book. This is what the English expect. Yeah, this is it. And, and you see, I tell you what, you see shades of it in the writings of George Orwell, maybe, because oh, yes. he did a lot of his work on foot. Obviously, you know, when he wrote uh, Down and Out in Paris and London, and, all, and some of the essays that went into that, they involved extended walks, obviously, because he was tramp, literally living the life of a of a tramp. And when he did the road to Wigan Pier, um, although it's not that evident in the finished book his diaries that deal with that period I mean a lot of the journeys when he led to uh, to Wigan Pier in the north were done on foot from Stoke-on-Trent which is which is a fair old distance although he did cover bits of it by train um, I just think that obviously the, the, the footpath movement was quite big then it's when there were I mean we always have encroachments on common land in this country we've been having them for hundreds of years but uh, in the early part of the 20th century there was a movement to kind of um you know, legalise access to footpaths mm-hmm. and to common land. So whether it has a relationship with that, but it also has a relationship with the, the new suburbs building up, with the growth of the railways. A lot of these ramble books are only sponsored by the railway companies. Oh, I see. You know, encouraging people to go out into the countryside near the cities. And So it, oh, they look fairly innocent superficially, but I think there's a certain sensibility that undercuts a lot of them, which goes beyond just kind of go out and get some fresh air. So there's more to it than more to a walk than and then a ramble. They're not, you know, what it's often said about the British that, I mean, I think you're going to go to Paris on your series of journeys, aren't you? So it'd be interesting, you might be able to make this contrast. Sooner or later. Sooner, yeah, you might be able to make the contrast for yourself. But it's often said that we're not that fond of intellectuals in this country, we, <laughs> we, we, we haven't been. I'm not sure, so sure that's true, but uh, it's sort of, you know, if you imagine the very kind of intellectual stance taken by the surrealist, for example, who were contemporaries of the Ramble book authors, who were doing the same thing. I mean, this is the thing, the surrealists in France were going out into the countryside and doing their wacky walks around the countryside, which then turn into psychogeography of the right. situationists. They built a framework around it all, yeah. whereas the Englishmen didn't do so much system building around it. This is exactly it. They, just, they wanted to kind of demystify it. They didn't want to wrap it up in a load of intellectual gobbledygook in a way. They wanted to make it accessible to the common man. Maybe that's something to do with our kind of like Protestant, you know, kind of uh, mentality or not. I don't really know. Now, where do we find ourselves at this at this moment? What are we? Well, you, you find yourself now on the edge of a of a Roman road, the, the, now called the Portway, but originally called the Porta Via. Some of these things, actually, I'm saying that. They can, who knows? I mean, I've got this from because one of the things I really love about the old. There's also the topographical books, I should say, as well, which sort of interlink with the Ramble books, like Gordon S. Maxwell's books. You couldn't follow, for example. You. you they don't give you a route, although they describe areas. And the topographical books, actually, I probably use as much, if not more. And uh, they are just descriptions of places and, and descriptions of a walk through those places. And, and there's an old history of East and West Ham 
and they were, all these books were written by amateurs, you know, and I regard myself as a complete amateur, you know, a very enthusiastic amateur. And, and uh, so when I say this road here was called the Porta Via, it was a Roman way, I wonder if the archaeologists and historians would back me up on that. Oh, but it, apparently it was, because the main road, the, the, uh, the Romford Road, which is the big road that goes out through Stratford East, mm into Essex, that is a Roman road, no one can test that, it's very straight, it runs from the centre of London out. I see. And, and this is, um, is a, it's if you like a branch road that led to, um, there's an ancient British camp in Barking called Upwall Camp, which predates um, the Roman invasion, but the Romans built on top of it, they built a Roman fortification on Upwall Camp, and this road takes you to up whole camp. It's a probable Roman road we have here. Probable Roman trackway, yeah. I mean, you've got to imagine as well, this area was all very marshy right. and very boggy. So the areas where you could put a road that, you know, you, you would, you know, because mm. to go off the road would, would have been fairly uh, ill-advised, really. Mm. And so we find ourselves opposite West Ham Church. And um, anyone, I, 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 I imagine most people saw some of the Olympics or something about the Olympics. And that is the, the, you know, the image of Stratford that's been projected to the world. But yes. really, for me, this is, you know, this is one of the oldest churches in London. And I think the, the sister church, West, uh, East Ham Church, I can't remember which one it is. I think it is West Ham Church, which claims to be the church in London, which is the, uh, the oldest church with the, that's held continuous services. Ah, so, so, the, so it's kept on going. It's kept on going continuously. So there are other churches in London that might be slightly older, like St. Bartholomew the Great, which right. was used in Shakespeare in Love, I think is older, but it doesn't have, I don't think it has or has maintained continuous services. Whereas this one does. East Ham does, but East Ham Church is closed a lot of the time, whereas I think we might be lucky. I think we could be able to go inside. Mm. And I think it's 12th century. I think it's about mm. that. Now, when did... It whatever writing you were doing about the walks you had taken turn into writing for an audience about them? Probably, um, probably when I started writing a blog, actually. Oh, I um, I'm just trying to think what came first, whether the public art project I did, because I, I produced documentation for that. Uh, that was part of the outcomes of the project. But So, yeah, when I started doing a blog, and I started doing the blog without really thinking about, well, probably like a lot of bloggers really, you don't really think about there being an audience and then suddenly you get you know, an email or a comment and somebody responds to something you've written and you start to go oh, okay, so there is an audience and the people are, you know, interacting with the work and then sometimes you would get even people writing who had a professional interest in what you were doing and maybe you'd supplied them with a bit of useful information that they didn't otherwise have and they would Reciprocate and right, and you, so there'd be a bit of a dialogue going on. What did people seem to be responding to when you were really getting traction writing on this blog about the walking you were doing, what you were discovering? To be honest, it was all sorts of things, really. I mean, one of the first um, posts that I did um, was when I took my, you know, my well now my, you know, my my eldest son, who's now ten, but when he was a baby. Um, just doing the usual thing, you know, going for a walk with him in the pram. Right. And uh, the the high street was blocked off. There was police incident tape, and I didn't know what happened. And then I sort of discovered that this young man had been stabbed to death. And, you know, I found out a little bit about him. And obviously I just had, you know, my first son. So it's quite a poignant moment. And it truncated my walk, you know, yes, not to, oh, damn, I couldn't, but you know, so it was something that happened on a walk that I experienced, and then it opened up this, this incident, which I wrote about it just in the moment. And then a relative of the, the victim got in touch because, oh. you know, they hadn't been able to find out any details from the family because clearly the family were traumatized by what had happened. And mm. they came to me and said, Well, can you tell me more? I need to know more about what's happened to my, uh, my relative. So, that is a fairly, um, I suppose, that's almost, I suppose that almost falls into the realm of journalism. I had a wonderful comment recently uh, from a walk I did a couple of years ago where I just took a photograph of a block of flats near where I live, mm. sort of like a 1930s block of flats. And I sort of, uh, you know, I sort of created a sort of fantasy in my mind of it. It's almost like reminded me of a sort of like a stone monument, like Stonehenge, the same way it seems to be aligned with the sunrises yeah, and sunsets. Yeah, sure. And 
it's always fascinated me this building quite i don't know what it is about architecture from that era which really sort of sparks my imagination anyway so i took a photograph of it and i wrote a few a paragraph about it and then someone left a really beautiful comment on it mm. saying that they had been um, born there and grown up there and then left at the age of seven to go and live in new york and um they you know obviously been googling for right. images of where right, they'd right. been born and found that and read it and it it really meant something to him. Uh, yeah, just more than a few have found their way to you in that fashion, I would assume. More than a few, and, and you know, um, one researcher, because I, I started, uh, you know, in terms of um, kind of a version of psychogeography, I was playing around with this idea that there were all these buildings near where I lived in Islington that were named after places in Devon, mm. uh, which is in the southwest of England, and uh, I sort of was joking about, which I thought was kind of curious, um, and I started joking about, I wonder if you put them on a map, if they would line up in the same <laughs> way as the real places in Devon. We'll just right. go through into the church if we can. Um, kind of as a joke, but also genuinely thinking, well, what's going on here? And then um, two people that read the same post. One was a person who, whose job it is to um, collate information about the architecture of London, about just literally where they list, it's called the Survey of London, and they just literally create lists of buildings when they were built, who they were built by who the developer was, who the architect was. So they, they came and said, well, I can answer a question for you. This is the reason. <laughs> it was this is the guy who, who uh, developed the buildings, who built them, and this is his story. And, but we don't know a great deal about him. The other person who got in touch that also read it was a relative of that person, descendant of them. Oh, and then these two people were able to... They got in dialogue. They got in dialogue, and it, so they were both very happy. Did they know why he named them after the... Stuff in Devon? Oh, he was from Devon. So it was, it was just... So, yeah, it was, just because no, he was from that. He was from Devon. And uh, to be honest, a lot of times in, in, uh, in London, you find that, you know, uh, a lot of places in London were built on the estate, on large estates um, that belonged to large landowners who owned land in all parts of the country. So you might find that they also owned a large pot of land in Gloucestershire, so hence you have places in central London with, you know, and also, you know, so it's, sometimes it's not very mysterious at all, actually. Right. Or they're named after prime ministers or lords or ladies. Or, mm. you but know. you find resonances of all kinds, I guess, and that's the interesting thing. Is it, it, well, like the Portway, I mean, if you saw that street, port, the, you know, if you saw there, in, you know, you're in the back end of Stratford here, West Ham, and you see Portway, you think, what on earth is that? Right. So maybe it does come from the Port of Via, you know, so mm. it's, it's not always... Um, but also sometimes I, I I don't know. I mean, I find interesting when you um, where where I live in Leytonstone, quite a few streets are named after places in South Africa, mm. and that's because the houses were built around the time of the Boer War. Oh, I mean, you know, and people were a lot of young men from the area would have gone and fought in the Boer War and and would have died there. There's a war memorial in the school, the primary school in the street where I live. And they've got the names of young boys who went to that school who died in the Boer War. So it's quite a poignant thing. So when you look at Pretoria Road, you might think, well, Pretoria Road. But then, you know, when you add that, you think, well, then you see that it's related to the Boer War and that local boys went off and died in a colonial war in Southern Africa. Mm. It- There's this way knowledge... Is it uh, knowledge, facts you pick up a crete into knowledge? And that's a process that on walking, that seems to facilitate... Walking seems to facilitate that process. That's right. I, I can't imagine you would ever come to those conclusions or think about those things if you weren't on foot. Mm. You know, you might not have the time. You'd be go, you, on foot. You do have the time to think about that whole. You go down the whole chain, and you know, oh, why is that and that? No, okay, okay. Let me test that theory or cast it out there to the readers and see who knows. This is it, and I think as well. Look, I've always been interested in history since I was a kid, so it allows me to. It facilitates this kind of ad hoc kind of um, punk history if you like it's kind of mashing together kind of do-it-yourself history yes. which you couldn't do if you were trying to be a historian um, but you know your interest might be different your interest might be in birds so you might notice birds your interest might be in shops so you might you know, I don't know whatever your interests are it could it would open those things up walking for you. reveals them exactly. you have to think about what's interesting to you and then you'll see what you are interested in yeah for sure for sure and again you know I think wherever you live whatever city you live in I think there are Cities are often shaped by commercial forces. Uh, I suppose maybe they always were, um, but certainly it feels, it feels now that it's, commercial forces are taking over from municipal forces, which particularly where we are now. I mean, West Ham was um, a very progressive London borough, or, or, and uh, well, Newham still might claim to be a progressive borough, but 
you know, very early kind of big housing projects, very early sanitation projects, uh, public health projects, uh, education, you know, school, you know, in terms of providing education for the, you know, the poor people in the area that have moved here to work in the industries and in the dockyards. Um, it was a kind of great progressive zeal in West Ham, in the borough of West Ham, sort of certainly through the 20s and 30s, a real hotbed of socialism. Mm. You know, now really the, the, the dominant force driving things forward is commercial. I mean, you don't wow. get a great sense of great civic projects anymore. Driven by progressive ideals, really, it's about money. You know, I mean that whole thing on the other part of Stratford is all, is all about, is all about that. Indeed. So, how do we get to that? And that's quite bleak, isn't it? In any case, do you think there's a way in here? Or have they? Have they? I, they shut out. You know, I was really lucky in the book. If you read, another plug for the book, the chapter in the book, I was lucky that I came here when there was they were doing some work. Right. You had a few lucky moments in the book. That was one of them. Yeah, loads. I mean, again, I suppose that you're walking us. You you recruit them. You do. What's lovely is a lovely little. Um, story that comes out of going into the church is that in the 1860s they revealed um, a mural in the church um what might not be a what might need a bit of explaining it if you travel around europe for example um you go to a lot of churches in particularly in in, in italy for example they're very brightly painted so you might think well so what's the big deal but you know here when we had the reformation obviously you know uh, sort of the kind of trappings of catholicism were were bleached out, you know, so literally. You know, they, they, they whitewashed, they didn't believe in kind of distractions. Oh, they could physically remove them, they would. They would, yeah. So when they, they uncovered this kind of very lurid fresco, or whether it's a fresco, I'm not entirely sure, but and that, having lived in Italy now, taught some fresco restorers, understand now what a fresco is, not necessarily just a painting on the wall. But um, yeah. they uncovered this very lurid painting all over the one end of the church. And uh, it was very quickly covered up again. And um, but a, a document was made of, w of what it depicted um, in the suburbs of hell. I think it probably would have been very. You know, it would have had a lot of naked bodies. Would have been a lot of cavorting. It probably would have been like a Hieronymus Bosch kind of painting. Yeah, I think they're called doom paintings apparently, and they do exist in other parts of the country. But then it was um, re, re. It was uncovered again in order to debunk this pamphlet describing it, and then quickly destroyed yet again. So there is a kind of a bit of a kind of Dan Brown type mystery going on inside this old church. Yes, the, the palimpsest in action there. Yeah. yeah. But should we... Um, so the, sorry, this would have been... The, you've been to Stratford, you've been to Westfield, where we stood there, that's yeah. the heart of New Stratford. And the image of Stratford now is they want to try and deny this is even here. Oh, this course. isn't here anymore. When you visit, if you're an international visitor and you come to Stratford, they've made it really easy for you to avoid this completely. You come out of the tube station, you go into the shopping centre, you go to... Um, you go to the big department stores and the chain stores and you uh, right. you buy your, your sort of third world clothes and you go home again. Um, they have you get off the tube, go into the mall and never, never really leave the whole tube mall complex, huh? This is it, but you, this really was the heart of old Stratford. I mean, right. anyway, although I suppose Stratford, West Ham, I get confused even now. Um, but we'll walk on from here to Stratford Abbey, which again was the, was the medieval equivalent of Westfield, if you like. <laughs> These, the role stays the same, but the entity filling it changes. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Well, they, they, you know, apparently they do build malls to mimic cathedrals, don't they? And there's that thing, if you create a lot of space above people's head, oh, yes. it creates a sense of awe and wonder, which is the, you know, you sort of fill it with metaphysical deities as long as there's, there's enough space to fit them in. You know? Give them the space and they will worship in some, in some way. Exactly, yeah. Mm. Now, what is the importance of pubs to your walking practice? <laughs> they provide the whole meaning. Um, uh, it's a good question. I'm trying to think of. I'm trying to. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a meaningful answer other than I just like them. Um, uh, interesting. Um, the pubs on my walks, generally, okay. There are a few exceptions. I'm realising now there's a record of me um, actually breaking my own rule. I tend to only go f for a drink at the end, mm. but um, I think pubs are just. They're just great social spaces. I think it is the best thing in Britain by a country mile. I think, you know, in this kind of very homogenized international kind of culture that exists now in most places in the world, I think, you know, that's the other thing. You go to a mall like Stratford, Westfield City, they're pretty much anywhere in the world and it'd right. be the same. Um, but I've traveled a lot and there's nowhere in the world like an English pub. 
no, even no English pub pubs. culture like here. Yes. No, no. Even though you have English pubs elsewhere, I mean, you've got a few in LA, haven't you? You've got the Cat and the Fiddle, and <laughs> yes, I was walking by that just before I left for <laughs> England. It's favourite back. place, isn't it? That's where it is. <laughs> you've got, but they don't have the same atmosphere or culture around them at all. Not in my experience. It's a, it's a place of kind of refuge, you know, and a place of where you can just relax and you can just. Obviously, it's it's you know there are rules and there are conventions, but you know I, I grew up in a kind of working class area. I grew up within a kind of working class culture, so for me it's very instinctive. Right. The, the codes that exist in a pub, the unspoken, the unspoken rules of the pub, the yeah. the, the the pub culture in all senses. It's interesting, isn't it? Because didn't Starbucks come up with an idea about Starbucks being what they call it the third place? Yes, or the, the new wave third place, I suppose. So yeah, that's what Howard Schultz saw as being missing in the commercial realm. Which I suppose, in a way, I mean, pubs used to function, I suppose they still do to agree, in a lot of ways. I mean, in... he was thinking about the States, though, where it's like you wouldn't really. A lot of bars are really sad places. Yeah, right, I suppose. Yeah. But just suppose in New York, maybe it's slight, I don't know, maybe, I, I say, I think there's probably, there's a sort of different culture in New York, which is got its own, obviously Ireland has an amazing pub culture, but yes. that's slightly different, in the sense it's a lot more gregarious, I think, because it involves music in a way that, if you just start playing a guitar in a pub in England, you get thrown out, whereas, you know, in Ireland, everybody, they give you free drink and everyone joins in. But, you know, pubs used to have um, sports teams, and a lot of them still do. They have football teams, sports teams. They're sort of at the heart of the community. And they still try to be, actually, to a degree. Right. But, there, you know, now pubs, I mean, this one here, I think, is still just about open. The one over the road is now a hotel. Right. That's a B&B. &B. That's probably started to cater for workers at the work on the Olympic Park. I see. Because it's a continuous construction zone around here now. Right. Um, a lot of pubs now, due to kind of local regulations, Supermarkets can buy them up very cheaply and without applying for a different kind of um, to change the usage of the building, they can turn them into what they call these sort of local supermarkets. Uh, so the big supermarket chains like Ralph's or whatever is that? That's the wrong oh, isn't in, it? In California, yeah, yeah we, we've got Ralph's, Vons, all that. Yeah, and but you see like a Tesco buy them up here, right? Tesco, Sainsbury's, and they turn them into these miniature versions of them. And they can do that actually without with very little red tape. So when I go into one of those, it may well have been a former pub. Well, up the road, you could go. If you went along the uh, Rom Romford Road up there, there's a pub that was a, was a very popular pub when I first moved here. That's now a Tesco's Metro, they call it. Yes. And they're, they're swallowing up pubs at a rate of several a week, you know. I thought there was more enthusiasm for pubs than that, or is there is that is that waning in England? Yeah, well, it's the, the I mean, the pub trade is a sorry old story, I think. I mean, it's, it's a picture of doom and gloom. I think the factors vary, yeah. depending on the places, but, yeah, just the, they're finding it harder to make, a, to make a living for one reason or another. Changing habits is one of them, you know. Oh, people don't drink as much. Um, they, they put it down to the smoking ban, actually, a lot of them. Oh, really? Which has been in effect how long? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know, actually, 10 years, maybe? It feels like in California it's been banned since the beginning of time, so... Oh, right, no, it's... I struggle to put a date on it, but I think it might be something like 10 years, um, maybe less, so actually. Recent, recent enough. Recent enough, yeah, recent enough, and, um... Yeah, yeah. obviously, there's... De in, in East London, you've got demographic change, but to be honest, I don't know... The, vi the village where I grew up... I was actually, funnily enough, I was looking on the internet yesterday and I saw one of the pubs... Well, two of the pubs, actually, in the village. One's been turned into a house that's on sale for nearly a million pounds, uh -huh. and the other one's available to be redeveloped as a plot of land with the pub. So, you know, when my dad was a kid, I think that village had something like 12 pubs. I think now it has three, hmm. four, maybe? Four pubs. They've thinned out in any case. Just, yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the, the property's worth far more for other uses than selling alcohol, basically. Uh -huh. you know. Here's something you don't really see on the walks in the States is all the low-rise housing and then up here these giant tower blocks, I guess you'd call yeah. them. You, you just, it's a fascinating element of the English and to an extent the whole Western European landscape to me is you just don't see this stuff really in right. the States. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's interesting here is I mentioned it in the book, I, tried, I struggled with it slightly, but because I, I grew up on, in so, well, you know, in the, on a council estate, we'd call it, um, in social housing, I think. Not, not quite the project. The project, for me, sort of conjures up the wire, you know. But um, so that's the, the, American, the American idea of 
projects, and indeed the inner city is very different than yeah. the European one. Well, it, what's interesting in what happened in, in Britain, when I, was, when I was born in 1971, so when I was in the 70s, the majority of people lived in social housing. And the, the majority, the, majo- the majority of people lived in social yeah, housing. Fifty percent of the population, striking. Yeah, didn't didn't own their own home certainly. Whereas I think that flipped, and part one of the reasons it flipped, not to go into a whole history of it, is Margaret Thatcher started selling people their council houses, which in one way was sort of seen as a slightly progressive thing because she offered massive discounts to people. Yeah. But what it was about was about turning. Uh, social tenants into homeowners and then they would be more aligned with the Conservative Party than they would with the oh, Labour Party. What's interesting about the new homeowner, homeowners voted for them. Yeah, and, <laughs> and kind of a lot of cases they did, you know, and I, I, as a kid, as a teenager, I sort of I could see that, you know, you could sort of think oh, okay, maybe that is progressive. We get to own our own homes and parents can pass their houses on to kids. I, it's confused, but that money certainly wasn't reinvested in social housing. Yeah. What's interesting about this street is which is unusual even in Britain, actually, history, I think, is you've almost got a history of social housing in the oh, United Kingdom. Oh, you do, yeah. You have some, these, uh, I think these are, these are probably just post-war, and they're sort of four stories, and they're sort of mm. probably masonettes, they're probably, stu- so that, that's quite a kind of, quite solid, quite nice places to live here. You have sort of houses here, these, these would all be, these would have all originally been council houses, social housing in this street. What gives away that, is it just that you happen to know that or that you can tell by looking at style. them? Style, yeah, so that's based on the style actually, uh, that was the, some of the first social housing built in London or actually in the UK was built about a hundred years ago by the London County Council and they had a very distinct style of council that I've lived on a couple of them. Fantastic flats to live in, built to very high specifications. If you were to build to those specs now, those properties would be worth a fortune, you know. Um, so that, but that looks like it might have been post-war. These tower blocks were obviously a big fashion in the 60s and 70s. And like you see now, um, in a lot of cases, in Waltham Forest, the borough I live, they've actually demolished most of them. Now, they've recognised the error of their ways. And funnily enough, is they were built as kind of a... Uh, a kind of response to slums that had grown up in London, right. you know, very old buildings that were in very poor condition, particularly in East London. So they were demolished in you know, kind of like a wave of progressive zeal, which mm-hmm. came from a very good place. And they thought these were the answer to that. Instead of these nests of run-down terraced housing... If that didn't work, this must work. Yeah, sort of nests of sort of tenements and ten- that were squalid and didn't have bathrooms and toilets and what. They built these sort of what they saw as these clean high-rise blocks but actually they're very low density mm. actually um they only look like they're, they're big uh, footprint. crowded yeah because right. they have a very big footprint so they're actually not a very good use of the space and obviously you know high-rises now in britain are associated with social decay with social problems and mm. so now you can see that this one's boarded up who knows this might one this, these might be coming down. I don't Maybe know. not long for this world. They've given a lot of them sort of facelifts and, and makeovers, but um, it depends. Some people love the tower blocks. I mean, they're, they've got a mixed history, I think, tower blocks. There's some really good ones and some bad ones. And over here, these look like classic sort of 1980s style, just uh, terraced houses. Sort of a, a traditional... As an actively traditional look to them, don't, don't they have? Yeah, they do, but it's, you know, and what's interesting, I mean, I don't know this specifically, but this is checkable. Uh, there is a wonderful map of bomb damage, but one of the reasons I think you get this pattern here, like you get, is because this area was so heavily bombed ah, I see. Uh, in the Second World War. It's prime territory for rebuilding, though. Yeah, and it would have been done as and when the money was available, you know. I mean, this is why a lot of the areas in London, people look at and they go, oh dear, I don't like that very much. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a lot of areas east of London, you know, around where we're going now, this sort of direction. Some of it isn't that attractive. Um, but when you look at the bomb damage maps, the bomb damage reports, I mean, one place where I went on my walk, that the entire ward was destroyed in one night. Oh, I see. The entire ward was flattened overnight so you know and then after the war they didn't you know things were tight and it wasn't necessarily the money to rebuild things in an attractive way and they had to provide homes as quickly as they could so you guess why you get this kind of mishmash pattern of development eh? also tell me about the importance of samosas to your practice <laughs> yeah you know it's <laughs> It's really funny, actually, these things that come up, because you just put them in. You think, I wonder if anyone's going <laughs> to... Um, Patterns emerge. Well, the, it's a very practical thing. The samosa, if you, I don't like, usually like to stop to eat, because if I stop, my, um, <laughs> on a very practical level, my left knee stops working. Right. Um, so I need to keep moving. And uh, also, because I, I just prefer to keep moving, to be honest. So if, if you're 
need to get food on the hoof and you're walking around suburban London, away from the main sort of shopping areas, you can, you can pretty much go to any news agent and the most reliable type of food you're going to get is a vegetable samosa. Now, not just samosa, it has to be a veggie samosa. You can have a, you can have a meat samosa and it not be right, and that's a bad thing. <laughs> I want to roll the dice on that. Veggie samosa, it'll fill you up. Uh, it's nutritious, it's, uh, and it's very reliable. There's a, very, a great consistency in, in the quality of vegetable samosas across the corner shops of London. They have all mastered the art of the veggie samosa. Veggie samosa, they probably all come from the same <laughs> factory somewhere out in the suburbs of West London, I'm sure. No yeah. It's the reason why I always try to keep my eye out for street food wherever I go because I want to explore the city as much as possible. Have to keep moving because of that drive. Yeah. So street food is the way to go because you can hold on to it by definition. Uh, it's, do you, have you any other street food tips in London? Are there areas you can go to get food that's mobilely edible? Well, you, what you have to do where you're staying, you have to go to the the Brick Lane Bagel Shop, which I'm sure you've been told uh, twice. About. But you know there are, twice already. You've already been. You, have you been to the one that's supposed to be Boigle? Uh, they, do they both not do that? No, the one, one I do is just down Brick Lane. It's 24 hours. You just yeah. turn down and you see it. It's too close to each other. One's got a very long counter. It's right. always busy. The other one's got a lower counter. One is supposed bagel with an H in it. Oh, okay. I went to the one with B-E-I-G-E-L, I think. Ah, well, the one with the H in it is the one you need to go I'll, into. I'll try both, compare yeah. and contrast. And uh, that's the original one. That, that's amazing. There's salt beef. If you're, if, you're, if you're not a vegetarian, the salt beef uh, bagels there are stunning. Uh, I tried one at the other one, I think, and I liked it a lot, so wait till I try this You'll this die. next door one. Yeah. yeah, it's the one with the really long counter that's a higher counter, and that's that's the... That's the maybe it's the one you've been into. The, anyway, I want to try both. So. Chips. Yes, chips. True. I haven't, I haven't gone for fish and chips yet. I'm going to, going to do that at some point. Yeah, I mean, I don't mean potato chips. I mean, you know, my wife's Australian. They call them hot chips, yeah. which used to really confuse me. I think, what other chips are there? Right. But then I realised, actually, I suppose uh, Australians and Americans call them you know, crisps chips. So, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I, so I, you definitely got to get some chips. I think, it's true. what other street food in London? Oh, yeah, I think, I think that's probably it. I mean, you know, I... I I have quite proletarian habits in that sense. So oh. I, I do like a pasty, yeah. a Cornish pasty and a donut. So did Orwell. Yes, so did Orwell. Yeah, well, there you go. What, what, but God, he's miserable old sod, isn't he, Orwell? <laughs> I do love George Orwell, but, you know, when you, there's not a lot of joy in his writing, is no, there? No, there's not they, a lot of joy in he, he wasn't... He had a certain sensibility, I think, non-British come to associate with the British, which is that this kind of, not masochism, but enjoyment of hardship in this way. Yeah, it's true. And it was a lovely thing that Bill Bryson uh, said about the, about the British, is that one of the reasons he, he really loves it here, he says, nowhere else in the world would you get people's response to having a cup of tea made with a tea bag, which is, you know, a tea bag, hot water, a dash of milk, and people take it the first sip and they universally will go, ah, oh, that's lovely. <laughs> As if they just had a glass of fine champagne, you know, it's yeah, like, it's yeah, the yeah. best thing that, and that, that is true. A good cup of strong tea, there's, there's a few things like it. Um, but also murray mints are an important part of my uh, yes. my food source and, you know, boiled sweets is a great English product. You know, hard mints and hard sweets usually have a bag of those in your pocket or right. tube. There is a, uh, there's a, there's a kit to have for British walking. You need certain things. Do you know what's really funny? I, I want to send a thank you to my publishers mm. for, cause, you know, they were very supportive for the book and they, you know, lots of people work on a book. You know, writing it is quite a solitary thing, but then once you hand it in, right. you know, all sorts of people get involved in it. It's quite yes. astonishing to see. And so I want to say thank you. So I sent them, uh, I sent them, um, essentially, uh, yeah, my walking, uh, supplies kit and I sent them a crate of Stella. A box of samosas, lots of Murray mints, muesli bars, and crisps. It's the full package. Yeah, they were happy. They were very happy. Apparently, we we haven't mentioned, but you will not just drink in pubs. You will have a can of Stella on the go as you walk. Yeah, we, and it, it throws up a great contradiction because in the pub, I am a devoted ale drinker. I drink real ale, which is a un, uh, unique drink to well, these islands. There's people probably on the east coast of the United States now. Um, bitterly disagreeing at there uh, we'll have them because there are some fine ales that is true brewed in that part of the world but uh in the pub in you go into a pub you know pint of ale on the on the it's one of god's great gifts if there is a god uh but when i'm walking yeah a can of steak because ale out of a can is vile whereas uh stella and because i have a i had um an arthroscopy done in a local hospital in hackney which is a place where 
you know, if you if you get shot, get yourself to Homerton Hospital no. because they they really are brilliant at put, patching. It's like a field hospital in Afghanistan. They're prepared. They're brilliant at that. Trauma wounds, no better place. They've mm. got a lot of practice. Uh, I had the opposite. I had the most minor keyhole surgery possible. Yeah. So consequently, my left knee is uh, very unreliable. Uh, they, they, they messed it up. <laughs> so you want to do a long walk. Yeah, it's got about eight miles in it. So if I want to get more right. than eight miles out of my left knee, I have to lubricate it with strong lager. I see. It's, it's a reliable, you're right, counter of distance, though. You know you've gone eight miles. Yeah. It stops. It's like, like someone from Monty Python's Ministry of Silly War. Yes. It's just swinging this useless flesh lump around from my hip. Um, now we've wandered into a, into a garden, I see. Yeah, this place is wonderful on two levels. Um, basically, where we are is part of the old garden of the Stratford Langthorne Abbey, which was established sometime, I think, in the 12th century by a Norman, uh, a Norman baron who basically stole the land. I suppose, you know, the Normans invaded Britain and they stole the land from the Saxon barons. He got given this for doing some dastardly deed. Uh, William de Montfichet, I think if you were French, you'd probably say Montfichet, but we're in Stratford, so it's Montfichet. Right. And he built an abbey here, the Stratford Abbey, and it became a sort of real driver of kind of local activity, I suppose. It was a, we're at a train station. I didn't realise that. Yeah, it's the Docklands Light Railway, which is one of my favourite experiences. Have you been on that yet? No, I haven't. I, I wasn't even... It's another one of those things people think are... People here, Londoners say, oh, that's that's different than the tube. But to me, it's all on that one map. So I think of it as one more line, but it's a different thing. It's completely different. There's no drivers. It's like it's kind of, it, also, it's no drivers. And when it goes, it goes through Docklands, you know, which is this 80s kind of Thatcherite dreamscape, you know, mm. of just pure money turned into real estate. <laughs> um, and uh, it, but it glides through the it's like a magic carpet ride through oh, the tower. Awesome. Yeah, it's amazing. And you can sit in the driver's seat because the driver's just I don't know what the, there's a bloke oh, on here there. it comes. Isn't it? It's like a little pod. There's uh, a bloke who sits at the front there, but he just sort of turns it on and off. I don't know. I really don't know what they do. And it's um, it's a really wonderful experience. I only reason I, I got it when I first arrived in London. Funnily enough, the first week in London when I was 18, I had to get it to come out here. And then I didn't really get it again. And um, and then I got it when I went out, when I came back from Beckton, and it goes right into the sunset. Oh, so really? you get it, and you can sit at the front of the train, and you go right into the sun. Ah, it's incredible. It's going on my list of London experiences. Oh, it's fantastic. It's starting to rain now. But, so we're in, the, yes. we're in the gardens of the old abbey, right. and we're looking at the footprint of one of... Uh, as far as I'm aware, this is the only building that remains from the uh, 12th century abbey. Oh, yeah. And it's not even real. I mean, it's the footprint of it. Right, a, of you can see what it... Was shaped like. Yeah, that's right. You can see, and it's. An, I think it's one of the outbuildings. Actually, mm -hmm. it's not rather part of the main abbey. And um, what it is now is it's a community garden now. Right. So people are encouraged to come in here and, and grow stuff. Mm -hmm. um, things that people grow here. There's a food box at the front there, so people just leave produce there so for lo other local people to come in and and take away. And it's a really beautiful. Uh, it's, you know, it's a real beautiful ad hoc kind of uh, mixture of things people you know a lot of the raised beds have been built from old railway sidings there's um a wind turbine at the end which i think is yes. also made from recycled materials <laughs> so i find places like this incredibly sort of optimistic we hear the rain against the microphone so finally what what uh, how does the how does the weather affect all this what, what how does the weather play into what you see and feel and notice on these walks or do you not notice it because you grew up in England. Yeah, probably. I think the only time I really notice it is when it's very hot, actually. I think I this see. kind of weather I find quite easy to walk in. Um, the only time I remember the, the weather being a factor, the, well, the two times the weather was a factor, really, was when it was it was really hot when I walked out to um, Erith that day. It was uh, it was quite hot. So, But also there was, there was, there was some nice sun showers, so that was fine. Um, it was hot, actually, the day I walked through here. So the heat is a struggle, oh, and it was very, very cold when I walked to to when I walked to Tooting, which is the penultimate walk, and I did it in April this year, and I did it in a blizzard. Oh. <laughs> it was amazing. It was so cold. I hardly have any photographs from that walk. Right. And you can't uh, operate a camera and, like that. I do field recordings as well. And I hardly got any field recordings. You know, oh. It was um, it was so it was unbelievably bleak, but. Most of, do you know what? I was really lucky with the weather. I think I don't think I mean, this is a fairly grey day today, isn't it? It's fairly kind of kind of grey. But if you look over there, look, there's optimism over there. There's lovely, clear blue skies. You need only look over the railway. Yeah, which, look at the sky. Which is where we'll uh, which is where we'll head now, if you like. Or we could hop on the DLR back to Stratford if you want to get out of the rain. Well, let's see. I'd see. 
given that we're at the end of the interview, what's what's your choice? We can we get a recommendation to listeners who are replicating this walk. What should they do? Um, carry on walking, because what you would do is you would you would um, go over this bridge here, hmm. and it takes you to uh, takes you to a couple takes you to the Abbey Mills pumping station, which hmm. is a, a Victorian pumping station. It was built to service the, you know, the original sewage works of London. This is the northern outfall sewer, so it's the pushing the sewage from north and east London out to the Beckton sewage treatment oh, works. So it was a grand Victorian kind of engineering scheme, you know, mm. the, the, London, the famous London sewers, and that's an integral part of the infrastructure for that. And then also there's a network of rivers that thread around it, mm. and some of those rivers were cut during the time of Alfred the Great in order to kind of strand a Viking fleet who'd sailed up the River Lee so this is slightly contested admittedly um, but it's believed that then a series of channels were cut mm. around Stratford uh, to drain the water to lower the water level and that stranded the Viking ships and then they were attacked and then the Vikings fled over land uh, to leave their ships behind that was something that wasn't necessarily accepted uh, it was kind of a theory and then a, a, a few years ago they excavated a, ro a Viking longship um, they found up the, the real thing. Up the River Lee in Tottenham, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it added a bit of veracity to that story. Yeah. The palimpsest of history, once again, made visible. I've been walking here in Stratford with John Rogers. He's the author of This Under London, This Other London, right? This Under London next. And you can go, can you go underground much in London? You can, you can. That's been done to death, though. Well, I mean, okay. there's some very good books. I mean, done to death, but done very well. There's some right. very good books uh, exploring London underground, actually, as well. Certainly three or four mm. solid books about subterranean in London. After they read yours, they can read those. Then. They can read those. Steve, Stephen Smith is a good one. There's a lot. There's a lot of things on the London because you know we built the first underground trains and and the first major sewage system. Right. So there's a lot of time. <laughs> there's a lot of tunnels under there's, London. There's things under there. Yeah. Well, John, thanks so much for taking the time today. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. Special thanks to everyone who backed Season 4 on Kickstarter, including Joel Neville Anderson, Daniel Levin Becker, Paige Calvert, Commander Manvark, Jonathan Crow, John Cunningham, David Dawes, James DeVito, Tim Dobbs, Paul Doyle, Jake Elliott, Kevin Emmett, Lawrence English, Jonathan Filbert, Andrew Philippone Jr., Michael Fransky, John French, Themis Douglas Eucrucius, Will Graham, Umberto Grant, Samuel Hansen, David Hayes, Jeff Hilnbrand, Mark Hines, Andrew Johnstone, Tadeusz Andre Kudlubowski, Peter Kavanaugh, Ted Kane, Andy Cooney, Evan Landman, Alfred Lee, James Maloney, Sean McDonald, Alberto Bruzos Moro, Jason Miller, Rob Montz, Daniel Murphy, Richard Nash, Aidan Nullman, Patrick O'Flaherty, Danny Olson, Michael O'Regan, Ian Plosker, Christopher Porter, MJ Pritchett, Piers Rippey, Rob Schultz, Todd Shimoda, Cam Smith, Deborah Smith, Adam Sutherland, Maureen Kincaid Speller, Anna Traher, Thomas Interberger, Matt Warren, Nick Wagelt, Dion Wolf, Cynthia Yang, and Wayne Wright.